Hello, and welcome to our GCLS Members Only Online Book Club. Our author today is Cheryl Head, and her novel, Find Me When I'm Lost, a Charlie Mack Motown Mystery is the book we'll be focusing on. And I will say congratulations for your nomination for the Anne Bannon for your being a finalist. Very well done. I'm very excited for you. It was a great book. I love reading it. Thank you. All right, but first, before we jump into that, I want to talk about our sponsor. Today, we are sponsored by The Lesbian Review. The Lesbian Review, also known as TLR, is a website focused on reviewing lesbian fiction, lesbian movies, and lesbian music. In their words, we review only what we enjoy. That way, we promote the best products and help lesbian and queer women find their next read, listen, or watch. Primarily focused on books, as of January 2021, the TLR has reviewed over 1,500 lesbian novels. You can find them at thelesbianreview.com, where there are links to their social media, and they have, they have a great Facebook page, and a place to sign up for their awesome newsletter. Following TLR is an easy way to boost your reading list with only the most brilliant lesbian books. So please give them a look and find your next read. So I hope you check them out because I'm a big fan. We're going to talk about these books. One of our goals for the GCLS Online Book Club is to promote, promote fabulous authors and their work, but also to continue to build our community. And thank you all who are on here and listening to the recording. Thank you for being members. Cheryl, would you like to tell us something about your book? Hey, hey folks. <laughs> Good to see some faces in the little boxes. Love it. Um, yeah, so what, my question is, tell us some, something about myself. About yourself, your book, whatever you want to talk about for a second. Okay, let's see. It's May Day, International Workers' Day, so I'm wearing red in solidarity with the laborers and workers around the world. I had a nice. earlier today where we talked about that, so that's really why I'm wearing, <laughs> why I'm wearing red. Uh, really glad to be here with Ellis and the, and the book club. Uh, it's a fun thing to do in an afternoon on a Saturday when I've done all my chores and it's not eight o'clock at night when I'm thinking, hmm, what am I going to have for dinner and when am I going to bed? So, you know, <laughs> I have some energy <laughs> uh, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Glad, happy to be here with GCLS. We are happy to have you. All right, now I get to actually read your bio. Ooh. Yes. Cheryl spent 20 years in public television and radio before turning to fiction writing. Her first novel, Long Way Home, a World War II novel, is a story of the experiences of Black soldiers in America's segregated wartime army and was shortlisted by Next Generation Indie Book Awards in the African American fiction and historical fiction categories. She writes the award-winning Charlie Mack Motown series, Mysteries, sorry, which is a series, but Mysteries where has a female PI protagonist who is both queer and black. Her books are listed in the Detroit Public Library African-American book list. In 2019, Cheryl was named to the Hall of Fame of, of the Saints and Sinners Library Festival. And she is a current member of the National Boucher Com Board of Directors. It's about your kind. About your kind. Dang, I went with the French. I, yeah. I should have asked you beforehand. But... Genesis Court. <laughs> All right. Do you want to do a reading from your book? Yes, uh, I would like to. Uh, this, so this is a few minutes, about five minutes from Find Me When I'm Lost. Um, so this book, um, I'm not sure what how the idea came to me, but I wanted to do a book that involved Charlie's kind of previous life. So the, the concept of this book is, is that uh, Charlie gets a, a late night phone call private eyes love that when they get a late night phone call from someone she doesn't really know. It's the new wife of her ex-husband. Charlie, you, you will remember if you have read the series, is bisexual, but has since gotten to uh, an exclusive relationship with a woman named Mandy Porter. Um, but she gets this late night phone call from her ex's new wife, who she's never met. Um, the ex has been charged with the murder of the wife's brother and both the ex and Charlie are convinced that Franklin has not committed this crime because they know him. Um, the excerpt I'm gonna read you is um, from 
some of my favorite parts when I'm writing, and that is writing about witness and uh, interviews and um, um, source, inter source interviews. I love kind of these characters that you only see once uh, and Charlie and Don interviewing them. I have a lot of fun with them. It allows me to uh, use the little tidbits of things I've observed over the years to give people quirky characteristics and stuff like that. And so I have a lot of fun uh, writing those. They're not important to the book necessarily, but fun for me to, to, to write. And in this particular one, um, it starts off with a little bit of a domestic scene with Charlie and Mandy, and then goes into this interview of one of their, um, their case sources. Charlie and Mandy lounged on the couch. The newspapers were scattered on the table and the floor. Ham snoozed on the carpet and the Sunday news shows added background to their easy morning. You want another cuppa? Charlie asked, sliding socked feet into her slippers and reaching out for Mandy's cup. Ham lifted his head. Ham is their dog, by the way. Don't mind if I do. How about another piece of toast? No, but Ham wants some. Ham wants any food being prepared in the house. Don't you, boy, Charlie asked. I think he's ready for his walk, too. Mandy followed them into the kitchen. She rubbed Ham under the chin. He's been out once this morning. He's OK. I'll walk him when you leave. I'm sorry I have to work today and last night. And don't forget the night before, Mandy said. Charlie put an arm around Mandy's shoulder and buried her face in Mandy's lush hair. I think your hair is my favorite part of you. It's not my brain? Oh, yes, it's your brain. Your hair is second to your brain. Oh, and your breasts, especially the left one. Ham always wanted to be part of the kissing action and he stood on hind legs to lean on Mandy's. The three of them were held in a love knot for a few seconds. Have you spoken to Franklin again? Nope, I guess I can call his father if I need to speak with him. Do you have any evidence of Fairchild's involvement in the murder? No, nothing we can prove. Well, who are you meeting today? The manager of a woman Peter was dating. She's a pole dancer and a law student. Well, good for her, Mandy said after a pause to reflect on that idea. Does the manager have something to do with Peter's murder? I doubt it, but this guy had a couple of run-ins with Peter, which turned physical. Don and I want to ask him about it. Well, I really hope the father didn't do it. That would be horrible. What's that called anyway when a parent kills a child? It's not fratricide. That's killing your brother, right? Right, it's called filicide, the deliberate act of a parent killing his son or daughter. Judy looked it up the other day. Nasty word, yes. And if it's true, even nastier business. George Burston had been in and around show business for four decades. Framed eight by 11 photos on the walls of his untidy office for the greetings of entertainment and sports celebrities who were household names in Detroit. While Don schmoozed with the guy, Charlie scanned the pictures. Gordy Howell, James Brown, Madonna, Jackie Wilson, and Dennis Rodman had all scribbled their thank you notes to George. Apparently, he had once been a real player in artist management. I know you must be busy, Charlie started the meeting, so we won't take much of your time, Mr. Burston. Laney said I should speak with you, he said. I like her. She's a talented young lady. Not quite Gordy Howell, though, Charlie said, attempting humor. Burston gave Charlie a hard stare, shifted his eyes to Don, then back to her. We did a little research and found out you spent two years in prison, Charlie stated. Oh, I get it. He's the opening act and you're the headliner. Or is it good cop, bad cop? Charlie ignored the comment. Tell us about your relationship with Fairchild. I don't have a relationship with the guy. But you knew him, Don said. He hung around your client, didn't he? He hung around Laney all the time. He was an asshole. So you're glad he's dead, Don asked. George looked amused. He pushed back from his desk and crossed an ankle over his knee. You guys are great. You kind of remind me of Esther and Barry Gordy. They came to my office once to give me some grief about one of their singers. God, that was a long time ago. I think I was only 20 years old, George smiled, reminiscing. They put a good scare into me that day, but I've been around the block a few times since then. George uprighted himself and aimed his next words at Charlie. And you're right. I did spend a few years behind bars on a trumped up extortion charge and I didn't get out for good behavior. So you two don't scare me at all. Let's get to the point. I didn't have a thing to do with Peter Fairchild's death. Laney told us you fought with Peter, Don said. 
The guy didn't know how to hold his liquor and Lainey was in danger of losing her gigs if Peter kept interfering. How did he, how did he interfere? Peter was jealous. Lainey knows the score. She dances the pole and she's an artist at it. The men come to see her, they pay a cover charge and they drink, which is good for the club. The men also tip, which is good for Lainey's college tuition. Where were you on Wednesday? Seeing to one of my acts at a club in Dearborn, I was there all day, it's called the round table. That's a good alibi, Don said, but maybe you paid some guys to take Peter out. Look, I told Lainey if she continued to hang around Peter, the gigs might dry up. That's all there is to it. I might not be dealing with A-list talents anymore, but I have a good business and I wouldn't jeopardize it for a client who brings in maybe 10% of my income. The papers say that Rogers guy killed Peter. I guess you think he didn't, but I didn't do it either. You're looking for someone else. That's it. I love writing those scenes. <laughs> and there's a scene with the pole dancer later where Judy and Don go to interview her and her name is Cursory Brief. I love that name too. I just amuse myself so much when I'm writing. <laughs> That's the best. That's the best. It's a great scene. Yes. I, was, I love the book. It did a great job capturing all the personalities. It was fantastic. All right. Now it's time to grill you. Are you well, ready? <laughs> no, it's not that bad. I have a few starter questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Before we get into the, the questions about the book and the ones in the chat, which I'll get to, I want to know what inspired you to write the Charlie Mac Motown mystery series. I did a break from my work. Uh, had been I, 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 the first book I wrote took years. <laughs> the, uh, the historical fiction, lots of work, lots of time in the library, and I really wanted to write something that was just fun, and I didn't have to think about a whole lot, and I have to didn't have to go to the Library of Congress. So I, uh, I whipped out. I think I whipped out the book in about four months. It wasn't Charlie was the lead character. Uh, it was not part of a series, it was a standalone. I just did it to just release myself from that first work. And uh, I self-published it. I just, I mean, I literally wrote the thing, went, ha, and then hit the button and put it on Amazon. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Salem West uh, read it. Salem must read every damn thing. So uh, I was at a book reading in uh, Provincetown. She came up to me and said, you know, uh, there was no romance in the book at all. You know, I write noir and it, and kind of the old school noir where it's the hard bitten pre-eye who doesn't have a life or a job or anything like or definitely not a romance and so she said to me um you think uh, charlie could be a lesbian and i said i think so and then i went back to my beta readers and they all said we thought she was a lesbian so i thought well this will be easy to uh, manufacture so that's how it came about <laughs> great great and then you just kept going i'm sure people were just like they probably were begging <laughs> All right, so tell us how you came up with this particular book plot. Um, I wanted, to, again, I wanted to do a couple of things with Charlie to get back to the relationship, to have the relationship with Mandy a little more front and center. Um, the book before had really focused on a, a lot on the case and not a lot on her relationship with her family, which is Mandy and her, their new dog. So, you know, I conceived of a, of a conflict that really might uh, have Mandy and Charlie second guessing their relationship, um, um, recommitting to it in a, in a way. They're, it's relatively a new relationship and I wanted just to put a little bit of conflict there for them to really uh, prove to each other that they want to be together. And so that was kind of what I was thinking when I, when I wrote it. Interesting. And then the mystery just kind of also evolved because it's, yeah, it's really a great package. It's, really it's good. harder for me to write the romance stuff than the mystery stuff. It really is. I'm getting a little better at it. Um, but those who follow the series will see that there's quite a bit of sex in one and almost no sex. <laughs> 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 there's lots of intimacy, you know, but there's not, you know, I had sex scenes in book one which were grueling to write. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, some people struggle with that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see what people are asking over here. Does anybody have a question? Here's one, Cheryl. The interaction between Charlie and Don is so natural. Is Don based on at <laughs> all on someone you know or knew in real life? Hey, Finn, love you. Um, 
So yes, Don is based on all of the white men I have ever known in my life. And there have been a lot of them um, in my, you know, my work career. And, you know, I've been around a long time and um, I've had white men who have been mentors to me. I have white men who have been enemies to me. So I know, you know, black people know a lot about white people and I know a lot about white men. And I'm amused by some, I, I have gotten to the point where I'm now amused by them more than anything, more than angry with them. Um, so Don inculcates all those things I've observed about white men over the years. He is my easiest character to write. I almost don't ever have to think about what he's gonna say. He's a reactionary. Um, He's not a bad guy. He's just a, a guy with privilege who goes around living his life. And but he, but he's he's also a guy who is expansive enough to be able to change. And and throughout the series, through the series, you will see some changes in Don. I think he's in lots of ways a perfect foil for Charlie. Um, he allows me to say all the crazy stuff I want to say that I wouldn't put in Charlie's mouth or anybody else's for that matter. Um, and so I have really a fondness for him. I, I, again, he just, I laugh out loud when I'm writing him. I'm writing and laughing. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> that kind of thing. In the book that's coming up, Don has a real epiphany, the book six that's coming in June. He and he and Charlie talk about it, and, and she's like incredulous. You mean to tell me you're good? You what? You know about your white privilege? You know. <laughs> nice, great character. Definitely great character. Totally agree. All right, let's see. We have another. Uh, it's from Renee. <clears throat> Question for Cheryl. Hey, Renee. You're from you're from Detroit. How does setting your series in Detroit serve you and your writing process? Yeah, that's a really great question. So yeah, Renee's from Philly. Uh, um, you know, I have written a standalone mystery. Uh, I've spun off one of the characters. Uh, I won't spoil it for those who haven't read the series and set it in DC. And I realized as I was writing, I started writing the series going along pretty good first couple of chapters and I got just stuck. And I realized it was because it was set in DC and I don't have the same kind of fondness for the city. I live in DC now as I do for Detroit. Um, and so it was really tough for me to, to write, um, you know, familiarly about the places I know of. I've been here going on 30 years now, but it's just like, doesn't have my heart. So uh, Detroit does have my heart. Uh, I have so many great memories of the, the resilience of the people who live in that city, the city's place in history. I think it's a bellwether city in the, in the country. It, maybe not so much now, but it was in the certainly in the 20th century. And um, uh, when I think about it, I think about it with fondness. And so when I'm writing about the settings and the various locales and the weather and the kind of the grit of the people, I, I do it with great familiarity and fondness. And uh, I was able to finish the standalone book set in Washington because someone helped me. I think it was my, my kid who helped me with this. I was, I was telling him about the, the problem I was having with, uh, with writing that book. And I realized it was because I don't have this fondness. And so I treated the city as not a, a protagonist, but an antagonist. And as soon as I did that, it was easy to get it out. Very cool. Thanks for that question, Renee. That was a great question. They're all great questions. Okay, Elizabeth has one for you. Oh. This is one, that, yeah, mm. this is a good one too. Yeah. How has COVID affected your writing? Yeah, I, this one causes me a little bit of uh, angst in, in responding to it because I know COVID has been such a horrible thing for so many people and has been deathly for so many families have been really desperately and horribly affected by it. Uh, for me, it turned out to be a, a, you know, a place where I could really flourish as a writer. I'm, I'm a big time introvert. I didn't want to go out the house anyway. <laughs> I'm wearing a mask. Felt good to me. I'm going like, oh, I can wear a mask all the time. People don't have to see my face, and I don't have to see them. You know, um, uh, so it. I was able to really use that space after the first couple of months of thinking I was going to die, like everybody else did. I was able to use that space to really uh, observe things differently and write about what I was observing. So I, I literally wrote two and a half novels in 2020. Um, so. 
COVID has been, you know, as that guy used to say on laughing, Betty, Betty, good to me. Yeah, I've kind of seen that. Yeah. By the way, we'll not get my references, but my friends who are older will always understand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> all right. I'm going to jump back to some of the questions people had submitted um, beforehand. I want to get to How you and see people. Oh, yeah, there you are. Hey, Finn. <laughs> yeah, our Hollywood Square is here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, let's see. Where was it? How do you choose your? How did? How did you choose your point of view in the book and the series? Mm. That was again because of the hard work of the first book, which I wrote in first person and vowed never to do again. So I automatically went to third person for the series. I have subsequently, I'm writing a, a book now, just finished another novel that's um, kind of a personal novel about Black Lives Matter and that kind of thing. Uh, and it's in first person. I, I, I can do it better now, but I understand the limitations of it now. When I was writing the first book, I had no idea. You know, I would, I would give it off to an editor who was a volunteer and she would say, this is really good, but how do, how does, how do they know that happened? How did this character know that happened? I'm going like, what are you talking about? You know, so, you know, I've um, learned how to work with first person. Uh, I think I will write more in first person. Uh, mysteries often, often do better in first person because you can really get in the head of your PI, you know? Um, but I also like, and you'll see in the book, sometimes I switch to first person uh, around the villain because I like to get in the heads of the villain. So, and I've been accused of be, being doing badly by shifting point of view within a, a, a chapter, which I have done. Uh, I think I've even shifted it in a, <laughs> in a paragraph. I try to do it in a way that the reader can follow and I'm not promising I won't ever do it again. That's actually an amazing skill set to be able to pull off. Pull I don't off know. Yeah, different I'm not, point of not based on skill. <laughs> Well, you do it well, regardless. Okay, Anne has a question. You're so busy with Lambda, and oh, she used that other one. <laughs> Bush Intercon. She did that just. She did that to trip me up. <laughs> and you've given so much time to GCLS. I don't know how you fit it all, how you fit it all in to begin with. But I'd like to know: Are you planning on writing, publishing anything that's not a mystery in the near future? know if I'll write something that's not a mystery. The the two that I have in the in the, in the sh on the shelf now are, are mysteries. The the third, the one I'm just finishing is a personal story. My uh, great grandfather was killed by police in Birmingham, Alabama, in 1929. So during COVID in February, when George Floyd happened, like all all, all of us, or many of us, we were appalled. But I was so angry and desperate that I thought this is the time to write this story about my great grandfather. And so I, you know, I've written that story and, um, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's a really good story. I feel really happy about it. I'm juxtaposing, I'm juxtaposing 1929 when he was dead in 2019 uh, with a protagonist who's a reporter who wants to uh, do a human interest story on Black Lives Matter and the two stories converge. Um, so it's, but, uh, you know, as I was writing it, I wasn't thinking of it as a mystery, but it, it turns out it is because at the end she kind of solves what's happened. Um, and, and so I don't know if I know how to write, I know I don't know how to write romance. I just don't, I admire it. <laughs> I know I don't know how to write, um, fantasy. I admire it and it sells. I just don't know how to do it, you know? Uh, I, I do write some short stories that are more family dramas there and not mysteries. So I think I'll be, I think I will shift. I think I will um, not be shifting and I will stick to mysteries. Anne Hagen, who writes mysteries herself, a fine mystery writer. <laughs> okay. Yes. Mysteries, I can't. I can't even imagine how you do that. I can't. I can't. <laughs> There's so many twists and turns that you guys pull off that uh, forget. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do a meet cute. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have another one from Meredith here. In the middle of bury me. Another fine mystery writer. 
Yep, awesome. In the middle of Bury Me When I'm Dead, and I really love the use of Alabama in this one. Will this reoccur in your work, the state and town? Mm, mm. That's really good that you noticed that, Meredith. I, I feel like I'm a little bit obsessed with, <laughs> with Birmingham. Um, so when I wrote the book as the standalone, the first uh, Bury Me When I Did, When I'm Dead was originally titled Trouble in Birmingham. Uh, because I, you know, my soul gravitates to that city to solve the mystery of what's happened in my family, I think. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I've been to Birmingham, I've been to other cities in Alabama. I haven't been to Birmingham recently, however. And, um, you know, I think places have secrets that permeate their soil and keep the space in a place of it can be good or bad, but I think for Birmingham, it's bad. I think there's turmoil there. I think too much crazy bad stuff has happened there for it to release itself, <laughs> you know? Um, all you have to do is be there to, to kind of feel it. It's kind of palpable. Uh, and um, I, think, I, think it, I think the city can cleanse itself over time, but I think it takes a long time. And so I kind of, um, for, for me, writing this, uh, this standalone story, uh, I feel a little bit like I'm have re released myself a little bit of the of the um, angst I had about Birmingham. I've been reading the story to my mother, who is it, it, the the story is about her father who was killed, and um, she's 92 and her eyesight's bad, so I'm reading it out loud to her and leaving out the profanity because she'd be going like, "Ooh!" So I've been doing that, but. Um, She's a, I can tell she likes, I've just started doing it. I've just read her the first two chapters and um, our, our thing is that we will get together and I will read her these chapters. And um, I, I was, she said, I, I wrote about her. I was a little, little hesitant about reading her this one chapter that had her voice in it. The stuff she says to me all the time on the phone. <laughs> so I read it and she says, I say that all the time. I said, yeah, no mom, that's why it's in the book. <laughs> So, I, you know, it's been a really good perch for me to do this book. It, and uh, maybe I'll leave Birmingham alone after this. One of my beta readers who's reading it now, it's still in its early stages, uh, but it's finished, is uh, a woman, a white woman from Birmingham, my neighbor who lives a couple, few doors down. And um, I asked her to read it and uh, just give me her sense of, I don't want to trash the city, but I want to I want to find out from her, does she feel like Birmingham comes out unscathed or in a way that, you know, people won't just dismiss it who, who live in the city. I love that you're reading it out loud to your mother. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's fun for both of you, definitely. At one point she said I was reading, she goes like, no, it didn't happen that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, whoops. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing like feedback in the moment, there you go. All right. Um, I think we're caught up over there. So let's take a look at another one. Um, Mercedes, hey, Mercedes. Where is she? Is there one from her? I see her box. No, I just look at her. Oh, her I'm, is... I'm, I'm here, but I'm, I'm covered over. <laughs> you know. <laughs> nice. All right. How much research did you need to do <clears throat> to write the book? And how much do you enjoy the researching process? Uh, I enjoy research. Um, I uh, will go down the rabbit hole. I bet this happens to all the writers on the call. You know, I, <laughs> I once started off, I can't remember what I, uh, which book, it was a Charlie Mack book. And I was researching something. And the next thing I knew, three hours later, I was looking up the profile for Paul Anka. And I went, how the hell did I get here? You know, I couldn't even remember what path I took. <laughs> but I was thinking, I love Paul Anka. I don't like that song. <laughs> So uh, I have to be careful with it. I, you know, if I'm really trying to write, I have to say, Cheryl, look up that one thing and then come back to the writing, you know, otherwise I'll be off to the races. Um, I do a lot of online um, when I, for the, for the Washington DC book, I did a little bit of driving to find what neighborhoods I wanted to be in. I use the heck out of Google Maps in a way, Google Maps has changed. Google Maps used to let you, five years ago, you could go down alleyways in Google Maps. Now they have blocked that so you can't look in people's backyards and stuff like that. So I use Google Maps quite a bit. Um, since I haven't been back to Birmingham in a while, I was on Google Maps and 
Birmingham quite a bit. It, it, you, you're only seeing it for a moment in time usually, but you can really get a good sense of things like traffic, um, flora and fauna, you know, things like that, that help with descriptions. Um, and then the only other research I will do is uh, occasionally, you know, talk to someone from the place I'm writing about, like, like my neighbor from Birmingham. And I talk to her a lot about race relations uh, growing up where, where she grew up in the city and things like that. For the first book, I did lots of oral histories because it was about World War II. And so I interviewed some African-American um, men and women who had been veterans, who, who, are, who were veterans. Yeah, I, I mean, research is amazing and it is easy to go down that rabbit hole <laughs> and some of the stuff that probably I search for makes people who might be checking wonder, especially yours, I imagine, with some of your topics. And in Washington, D.C., where I know the NSA is looking at everything, I, uh, I hope they know what I'm saying when I'm Googling incessantly, because I usually have to go back and go, what did it say about, uh, what did it say about IEDs? And what what explosive do you use? <laughs> that text from C4. You know, I'm hoping they know I write mystery novels. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. All right, Teresa has something over here for us. Okay. Look, uh, looking forward to your next your new book. She's looking forward to your new book. Can we read that right? Thinking of your other Charlie Mack stories. Charlie's PI team is very tight and de and develops. Find me when I'm lost. Spends more time exploring past family relationships. Franklin, her wife, her family, et cetera. Which do you enjoy figuring out? The team stuff, the family drama? Hmm, uh, that's an easy one. I think it's the team stuff. Uh, I really love the secondary characters. Uh, Judy is now her uh, an associate PI. I love Judy. <laughs> I, I laugh because I love her. Um, so it's the team dynamics I think about a lot, um, uh, again, because I think Charlie, I was telling somebody this the other day in another interview that I think one of Charlie's flaws is that she is a person who is not as emotionally available as she could or should be. And so someone like Judy helps her to tap into feelings that she might not normally have. There, there will be times when Judy will be crying and, uh, you know, Charlie's just like, yeah, he's dead. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you know and, and, you know, Don is the other person who is so extremely unemotional and, and um, caustic. It really helps to smooth out Charlie. She'll say, oh, maybe I should feel a little, have some feelings about that. Because if Don's not feeling anything, at least should feel something. So I'm, I'm constantly thinking about um, how they interact with each other. Um, I have taken one of the team members out of the series, uh, but I'm about to add somebody back into the series. Although I have no idea what book seven is going to be. I, I thought about that yesterday. I have no idea what it is. It'll come to me. It'll be good, <laughs> but I don't know what it is right now. <laughs> I'm sure it will be. It's great. A great series. All right. Janice had one for us. I like that I too. Looking at Janice's question. <laughs> Oh, you already read it? Okay, well, I'm going to read it. Okay. Well, I guess everybody could read it themselves, but for the recording, since they're not on there, I like how the series is set in the mid, late 20s or 2000s. I'm not going to read it well, apparently. How did you decide to use that time period? How far forward do you think it will go? Like you could do dozens of more in the series if each covers just a month or two. And speaking of Judy, I love the, their love of show tunes. Hey, Janice, that's great questions. I don't know if I know you, but we should talk because maybe you can help me figure this out. <laughs> um, uh, it's set in mid-2000s because that's a time in Detroit where it was at its lowest peak uh, on the brink of bankruptcy. The mayor was being investigated by the FBI. Uh, we had only, we, I still think of myself as a Detroiter, had only recently let go of the moniker murder capital of the world. Um, the, the auto industry was in turmoil. So that's the best time to have murder and mayhem in those kind of conditions. So that's why it's set in the mid 2000s. Um, it's slowly progressing. Uh, book six is set in the first um, 
months of the Obama uh, presidency. So it's in 2009. Um, I think it will start to progress uh, uh, maybe a, a year at a time. One of the things that helped me back so far is my fabulous editor, one of my editors on this call, Elizabeth Anderson, and my uh, developmental editor, Faye, um, Faye uh, said to me, if what's happening with Charlie's mom's Alzheimer's, you know, if, if you progress fast, she has to deteriorate. And um, her mom is a favorite character of mine. So I don't know if I want to see Ernestine deteriorate. So like Janice suggests, maybe, you know, next book will be next month, you know, and I'll go month to month that way, that way Ernestine can stay vital, which she is right now. But I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to, this next book hints at her own acceptance of her mental deterioration, but she promises Charlie that she's going to let her know when she really needs help. Her mother's an independent woman. Charlie's a fixer, so she wants to really be in her mother's business. And, um, and, and Mandy is the kind of person who says, let your mom have her, her strength and her, her magic as long as she can. So, uh, you know, I think that's going to be um, a major thread going forward. I, just, I don't know how it resolves yet, and I don't know how fast I want to move the book forward. My plan is I'll do at least one Charlie Mack a, a year. So we'll, we'll see. And then the last thing, I love Judy for the show tunes too. Yay! I'm, I'm a big Broadway nerd. Uh, my New York friends will tell you that I will call them and say, I'm so sorry about COVID. When will Broadway be opening again? Um, so <laughs> I'm ready for that. Yeah, Broadway opening again will be fantastic. So ironically, we actually have a question that was uh, written to me before, which is why did you choose to include Charlie's mother having Alzheimer's? Why did you have that as a plot element? Oh yeah, that's, you know, we are all, um, we are all people who take our experiences, our life experiences, uh, and that informs who we are. So when I worked in public broadcasting, I was a, I was a funder at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and there was a project called The Forgetting uh, that came to PBS. And I, I didn't know anything about Alzheimer's at the time. This must have been in like 1990 nine or 90, something like that, 1999. And uh, I didn't know anything about Alzheimer's. And so the producer who was working on this wonderful woman, really smart woman, had done this, this project, multi-part series of, about the caregivers who, and there are millions of them, you know, there, there are tens of millions pe of, of people who have Alzheimer's and millions of caregivers. And it was, it was focused on the work caregivers have to do and the resources they need and the support systems they need. They need. And I was really moved by the project. Um, I helped them get some money to do outreach so that they could take it to caregivers and things like that. And um, I always knew I wanted to write about it. It's a, such a, it's a mean disease. Uh, Elizabeth, I know your father suffered from it. Um, you know, it's a, it's a disease that at some in some cases, you don't know who your family member is. You don't know who your wife or your daughter is, you know? Um, so I wanted to write about it. I, I, I think it's um, it affects so many people and I wanted to write about what it looks like and what the dynamics of that in a family might be. Yeah, it's a powerful element in the story. So it's a good inclusion, definitely. All right, I think we got one from Finn popping up there. Thank you, Finn. I love the way all your characters are different and all live and breathe on their own. Do you have a system for keeping them all in character throughout the whole series? That's really good questions. I think uh, Finn is testing me to see if I could be an instructor for the Writing Academy. And I'm so dis I'm so going to disappoint her and say, I don't have no systems. <laughs> um, I, was I was talking to KC about whether she used Scrivener or something else to kind of organize. And when you're writing a, a series, you really do need to organize. I'm aware of that. Right now, it's all in my head, but you know, huh, that's not going to last long. So I'm going to have to come up with, I have backstories for everybody and I regularly go to their backstory and go like, oh yeah, that's right. Well, huh, and what about that part? Okay. Yes. But um, to have it all in one place, I might use Scrivener for that. Um, Casey was telling me she uses a, a spreadsheet. I, you know, that might be a way I do it. Um, 
I, you know, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I have a pretty good memory. Uh, I, I will forget things like what is the color of Charlie's car, but I won't forget kind of the the personalities of the of the characters and kind of. Uh, it's, I think that's because I each of the each of the characters. I'm a little bit of me is in is in them. So um, I'm so far so good with uh, keeping it kind of straight, but I, I'm working on that. Uh, and when I get it together, Finn, I'll be looking for a job. <laughs> so I have a question for you. Um, if you're writing about a year apart, that's, that's a pretty long time between books. Do you ever go back and, and read your books to get back in the zone? Uh, occasionally, I will go back and read sections of it. If you're know, like, if I see a review or something, I'm going like, huh? Or somebody will ask me that, and I'm going like, who are you talking about? You know, they'll because readers will remember characters that I'm going like, is that in the book? <laughs> you know, so I'll go back and look that way. But normally, I don't go back and read them. Um, you know, I've only got, it's just five books right now, so that it would be easy to do. But um, and and the other thing is, and as writers, the writers who are here will know. When you go back and read it, you always see something that needs fixing, and it's really demoralizing <laughs> to do that. Yeah, some of the cons of re yeah. reading it again. Because <laughs> I mean, I, I like Bury Me. I think it's a really good story still. And then I see parts I wish I had written it differently. Oh my God. I go, I'll say, oh my God, why did I say that? Why did I? Write yeah. that? I don't need to be in there. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. All right. Let's see. On here, I have how much of you is in Charlie Mac? Yeah. Um, oh, oh, I, I tease people by saying Charlie is a younger, smarter, braver version of me. But yeah, I'm, I'm in her, that's for sure. My um, maiden name, Head is my married name. I was married once upon a time. My maiden name is McGarra, McGarra, Scottish. Um, so that's where the Mac came from. And, you know, Charlie is a variation of Charles and Cheryl is a variation of Charles when you go and look at name um, backgrounds. And so that's where the name came from. It's a cool name, Charlie Mac, P.I. I mean, how it, can you not? It sounds like Jimmy Mac from Motown, Jamie. Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see how we're doing on time. All right, we got, we got some time for more, definitely. Okay, <laughs> firstly, I'm not a fan of this question, but they did ask it, so get ready. Thank you, Lynn. I'm looking at Lynn's comment. That Thank you, Lynn. Appreciate that. <laughs> if you were gonna have one of these made into a movie, oh, who would play I've got, Charlie Mac? I've got the movie cast for Barry Me. I've got the movie, I, on the first one I did the whole movie. I have wow. a folder called The Movie. <laughs> Who I want to do the reading, uh, the, the the music, who I want to direct, who I want to be the actors. Um, it, I will say this uh, a year ago, because it takes a long time for these things to happen, a, a producer uh, who works in the LGBTQ landscape um, got in touch with me on Twitter and asked if I would, con if I had ever considered it being a movie. And so she and I have talked. And um, I have what is called a shopping agreement for Charlie Mack TV or movie series. Um, so, but, the, but you know, she, uh, it's been a year and she didn't find a deal. She found a couple of nibbles and then people after George Floyd, people backed away because they, the people in Hollywood are really rethinking how they want to make um, detective and crime novels because they don't want to be too kind to police. I mean, this is all the stuff I'm learning from people who are making movies. Uh, but recently, last month or last month, I re-upped the shopping deal. So the producer is out actively looking for a movie deal for the Charlie Mac series. So that if it happens, I'll be grateful. Yep. We would all love that. That would be fun. That's great that you have that out there. It's, it's happening. That's, that's, I'm, I'm really happy for you. I hope that happens. That's awesome. All right. Um, yep. People also agree in the chat. What else do I have for you? Let's switch to your next novel. Oh, okay. What's coming up with the next one? Oh, I'm sorry, I was laughing at Elizabeth. <laughs> Those are joints. <laughs> There's a lot of eating in the books. I know, I can't help myself. Um, so the next book, oh, this is COVID 
COVID partly um, and an incident in Michigan last year drove me to write the last book. So warn me when it's time, book six drops June 29th, get it where every fine books are sold, um, is about the nascent beginnings of the alt-right um, hate groups in Michigan. Um, Charlie is hired by, there's been a series of hate crimes in Michigan in 2009 of the first Obama administration. And one of the um, hate crimes uh, was a fire started by an explosion which killed uh, a teacher in a mosque. And the family of the murdered man who doesn't trust the Dearborn police to handle the case well, hires Charlie and her team to find uh, the murderer of their husband, father. And so she and the team take off on, on the trek of identifying the murderers and it leads them, them to this um, loose and loose, both loose and sophisticated groups who are already at work in Michigan in 2009 to kind of perpetuate race violence. And it's um, it was started because I thought, who are the people who would have the gall, the nerve and the idiocy to think they could kidnap the governor of Michigan? Who are these people? You know? And so it's a story about who those people are and how they came to be in 2020, um, when look, but looking at them through the prism of 2009 and their early beginnings. Um, it, it turns out um, it's, uh, in, in 2009, there's this very available uh, FBI report about the growing number of hate, hate groups, many of them perpetuated by the Obama candidacy. And it outlines the number of uh, assassination attempts against it that were thwarted. I mean, so many that, that we don't know about that were thwarted even before the ban got in office, you know? So it looks at that and um, it looks at it in kind of a personal way and um, uh, one of the main characters is this young guy, this disenfranchised, disenchanted, distressed, diseased, uh, disturbed young man who it would become one of these guys in 2020. Um, so that's what it's about. Sounds intense. And we're all looking forward to it, definitely. Yeah. So that question from Elizabeth that you were laughing about, definitely needs to be in here. So Don's fixation on food is a fun element. Mandy and Charlie seem to be less about burger joints and more about culinary delights. Which are you? <laughs> okay, well, uh, my partner is on this call, Teresa, and uh, she will tell you that on any given night, I want some kind of food from some kind of place and I'm not really picky about it. You know, um, I, I love a good burger. Um, uh, yeah, uh, sure, I will eat a fine dinner in a fine restaurant, especially if I don't have to go. <laughs> if it can be delivered to me, it's even better, you know. Um, so yes, I'm 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 a foodie. I I'm a good cook too, though. I uh, I like to cook. Have I cooked for you, Elizabeth? I don't know. Yeah, I have. Okay. I, I like to cook and I like to eat. And in Detroit, we have some good food. And because Detroit was an ethnic city you could find really, really good ethnic food like you can in Philly and other cities. Um, so yeah, I don't care how bad the crisis is gonna get, you know, I don't care if terrorists are planting bombs, let's t stop and have some Chinese food, you know? <laughs> and, and they do. <laughs> and Don is right there, you know, Don, the way to his stomach. I worked in TV for a long time and I did learn that when working with my technicians, you know, like I was on, I was a TV reporter. And working with my cameramen, if you give them donuts, they will do anything for you. <laughs> so, yeah. So, just a quick question. I noticed Detroit, okay, and then Washington D.C. Two really large cities. Why? Why large cities? They're not gonna go on a farm. Or well, in terms, of, uh, in terms of the Charlie Mack themes, is that what you mean? Or well, yeah, and both actually. I, I mean, do you, do you enjoy living in the city? Is that why you're there? What what leads oh, you to that? Oh, I enjoy living in the city. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, that's a really good question. I think I could be a farm girl. I like digging in dirt and 
stuff like that. And I, you know, I, I could see myself sitting in a rocking chair with a house dress writing Charlie Mac in a, on a big open field somewhere. <laughs> Maybe Meredith can put me in middle of Ohio someplace. <laughs> I'd be happy to be there, I think. Um, because as an, as an introvert, I don't need to be in a big city. I don't need to see a bunch of people all the time. So I, although I don't think I would want to be, my mom tried to get me to move to St. Pete for years and years and years. And I thought that is too podunk for me to go to, but you know, even St. Pete has become a big city now. That's true. All right. Let's see how we doing. We're doing great. We're not trying. Any other too. questions here? So where can we find your books? You got, a, you got one coming out on the 29th of next yeah. month. Uh -huh. yeah. I ordered books is my publisher. Uh, I think you can pre-order there now. Of course, they're on Amazon and um, I've seen them in Barnes and Noble. I think they're even like at Walmart. I mean, uh, I had this conversation with Carol Rosenfeld and uh, Elizabeth Anderson from my production, my publication house one time when we were in New Orleans. And uh, I don't know if you remember this, Elizabeth, we were talking about, you know, they were talking about literature and blah, 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 blah. And I was going like, I want my books to be in that rack at the airport that goes around at the gift store. <laughs> That's when I know I'll be a success. Forget about literature. I want my book on that rack next to James Patterson's rolling around. So um, you can find it in a lot of places, but not on the rack yet. But I'm, I'm aspiring for, to that. I would just like to say that Cheryl is in the Hall of Fame for Saints and Sinners. So she's telling herself short. Yeah, that and I want to be on the rack at Walmart. <laughs> Some amazing achievements, definitely. But that would be cool too, to be on the rack with in the airport like that. Yes, definitely. All right. Anything else you want to tell us before I jump to what's happening next month? Um, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm fascinated by the food questions here. The food. <laughs> yeah. Some great comments. I wish they were on the video. I don't know, Lynn. I don't know that one. A, a great soul food place in an old factory. Wow. But if you find out, let me know. Um, what else do I want to say? Um, look for, look for this book, uh, about my great grandfather. Um, I'm hoping I'm working, using it to get an agent. I, I work without an agent. Um, but I think for this one, I'm going to need a bigger, footprint. There's not really an LGBTQ theme in this one. Um, but I think it, you know, I feel really good about the book. Um, I think it has a, a pretty powerful message about systemic racism and um, the long-standing practice of um, police violence against Black bodies. Um, mm -hmm. and so, um, I think it has both a hopeful message, but a really sobering message about how we should not uh, take these things for granted and we should understand that they are steeped in uh, um, a, a long history of systemic and internalized racism. Powerful, definitely. This was okay. fun. Yeah, this was fun. Is there anything else anyone oh, wants to ask? At two o'clock on Saturday rather than 8 p.m. I mean, yeah. that's, that's just way too late <laughs> for me. <laughs> Actually, one popped in there from Lynn. And I teach at Prince George's Community College, or CCC Community College, I guess, in Maryland. Would you think about talking to our students about writing? Love to, Lynn. I didn't realize you were local. I didn't know that. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll unmute myself and show my happy yeah. face. Uh, I've, been writing, I've been writing. Yeah, I've been here for five years. Uh, I moved from Tampa, Florida. Up oh, to and uh, since we're, you know, we're a predominantly African American institution, a majority minority, and yeah. I think our students that we have some really great writing students. In fact, we just put out a literary magazine called Reflections. If I can find it, I'll post it out on uh, Facebook for you. Okay, that would be excellent. Prince George's County is such an interesting county too. It, I don't know if it still has this record, but it had the largest black middle class in America in Prince George's County. It may still have it. Yeah, I think I think it still does. I mean, I really have such a wide variety of students. It's it's so much fun to teach these guys. Excellent. So, uh, I teach history and how to be a freshman. So, <laughs> so but yeah, I, I will definitely get in touch with you because I got to talk to the powers that be to see what they want. But I think that'd be great for you guys for you to talk to those guys. They're nice. just so much fun. Mm -hmm. sure Thanks. Yeah. Cool. So does that mean, okay, Finn, this is your opportunity. She's willing to do that. Don't you want it for the Riot Academy, right? I mean, 
we we come to Cheryl every year and we're like, Cheryl, what can you give us this year? And this year we're very blessed to have Cheryl mentoring one of our students, but we, we keep asking for a little bit more every year and you know, before before you know it, we'll have her full time. Having fun doing it. I've been reading the manuscript of, of this writing academy student and it's good. I read a little bit out loud the other day to Teresa. It's fun stuff. She's good. Look out for her. <laughs> excellent, excellent mentoring is fun. Okay. I think I'm gonna to jump to the covers of the books coming up. Or and the I, one that's out and one coming up, yeah. You know, I think that's not the cover. It might be the old cover, but I, I don't know. There are two different covers to this, but it might turn out to be good. Maybe I'll sell <laughs> Well, you sent it to me, so. I know, I know. <laughs> but Ann McMahon did two covers and I don't remember if that's the right one or not. So I think <laughs> but if you go on Amazon, that's not the cover. So just so you know. Okay, that's fun. All right, so next month, also Saturday in the afternoon, uh, I don't know why the time's not on here, but it's on June 5th, uh, 2021, again, 2 p.m. Eastern and 11 o'clock Pacific. And we're gonna be talking about an author named Melissa Therese. She's very popular, a very popular indie author, if you read any of the indies, and often on the top 100 for lesbian fiction. And she's going to be talking about Mrs. Middleton. And I've had a chance to already read that one. And it's, it's excellent and a little got some spiciness to it. So I think you'll really enjoy it. I hope to see you there. Hey, Casey, before you go, could I just read that cover blurb there in my, in my um, broadcasting voice? Their, yeah. love, their love could heal their hearts, but destroy the relationships they both hold dear. OK, thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Bravo. That was excellent. That's excellent. We always hope that you join our Facebook page if you're not already on there. Um, it's under groups for GCLS Book Club. And the nice thing about that is it gives you an opportunity to see what's coming up, but also give me questions and give me feedback and maybe other authors you would like to see. I'm also trying to fill a few positions in the selection committee for the book club. So if you want to talk about what's coming up next or what you would like to have come up next, I would appreciate it if you got in touch with me and we'll add you to the committee. All right, that is it. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Casey, love doing this. Thank you for being with me, everyone. Appreciate you all, love you too. Yes, bye-bye. <laughs>